You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jocelyn Jackson. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time.
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jocelyn Jackson on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called Never Have I Ever. And uh, guys, this is a fantastic read uh, that uh, will leave you uh, a little shaken at the end. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jocelyn. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. I am excited to have you. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, it's so obnoxious. (laughs) (laughs) That's the best. I was really little. I remember being in line at a church social, and you know how adults always ask, like, what do you want to do when you grow up, Jocelyn? And I said out loud with my mouth. I'm going to write a great American novel. <laughs> I don't even know where I had heard that phrase, but I was clearly not spanked enough as a child. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Amazing. Precocious, maybe. Pretentious, maybe. But that's okay. That's, you know, that's okay. That we are who we are. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, were you a big reader? Oh, yeah. Huge. And I was a sneaky reader. Oh, uh. Tell, yeah, I, tell me. I was a book stealer. I um, I read when I was nine years old. I read Roots. I read Jaws. I read Tender as the Night. I read To Kill a Mockingbird. I read every Conan book. I think I was ten when I started reading Stephen King. All these books belonged to my mom, my dad, and my brother, who was five years older, four and a half years older, and I would sneak them away and read them. <laughs> now, now those influences are wide and dense. Yes, that, that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, Conan I, to Roots. I think that's why I write the way I write. I really do. because, And I was also reading, like, appropriate little girl books. You know, I I had given Charlotte's Web and The Secret Garden and all that. So I was reading that, too. But, yeah, I think that's why my books are so weird. (laughs) Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because um, when I first got uh, a copy of Never Have I Ever, got an advanced reader's edition from your publisher, and, you know, it's blurbed by Lee Child. And, you know, which is amazing. And congratulations. I love Reach Your Books so much. I came in. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. A big day. <laughs> well, you know, when you, when you get a book that's blurbed by Lee Child, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times you can say, OK, I know what bucket to put this book in. You, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like I, I kind of if Lee Child is, is blurbing it, I it, it's going to hit certain points, you know, and yeah. and this book does. Uh, and about 50 other points that, that I would not associate with Lee Child. And it's amazing. Um, it, it kind of defies, um, genre a little bit. It, it has all of, uh, it, it has all the elements of a great suspense thriller and so much more. Um, when you started writing, um, did you recognize this, uh, these varied influences and, and what they had done to your storytelling? Um, to a degree. Yes. I mean, it's become clearer and clearer to me as I've I've continued in my career, but, but yeah, I mean, so this is my first book. I think that fits comfortably in a genre. Like, I I mean, this, it is, it is domestic noir. It is a thriller. And uh, my other books are even worse in terms of where does this go on a bookshelf? This book, I think it does do all the stuff that I do, but it, it it does it has that arc you need from a thriller but but yeah i think that and i'm still a hugely eclectic reader but suspense and thrillers are like probably my favorite kinds of books so i think it was a natural progression me too i i read all over the place and but i i'm a sucker for a great mystery and um you know twists and turns and uh you know great in-depth, you know, character studies of psychosis and, and things like that. I just, I love it. There's, there's something twisted about us, I think. Yes, there's definitely something wrong with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, after announcing at the church social that you were going to write the great American novel, mm-hmm. um, you know, how did you, did, did you have a plan? Did, did you follow that up with anything or did you forget that statement for 10 years? Kind of, what was your trajectory from there? Um, I got I got bit by the theater bug. So I, I always wrote like in middle school, they made those blank books that I'm aging myself. But when I was in middle school, those books that 
it was the first time bound books that looked like an actual book with blank pages came out. And I wrote novels into them. And it, a novel in my head in sixth and seventh grade was as long as I had pages in the blank book. <laughs> that was, <laughs> and they were all like Stephen King, you know, horror, cheap, cheap sixth grade Stephen King knockoffs, you know. Like I remember I wrote one called um, Don't Go Into the Woods in which one by one girls who strongly resembled the girls who were kind of mean to me went into the woods and <laughs> nothing good came of it. Um, <laughs> so I was writing novels from middle school all the way through to high school when I had the theater bug got me. And I started writing plays. I wrote plays with my friend Yvonne Ford. I wrote plays on my own. I was in all the plays. I started as a theater major with a strong interest in acting and playwriting. Even and eventually, um, I I came back around to novel writing just because I'm not I'm very collaborative as an actor, but I'm not collaborative as a writer. I learned that about myself. And to be a good playwright, you really need to leave room for a director and room for actors. And when I'm writing, I want to I want. I want to control it all. I, I, I want the world in my head to get onto the page, which is not a playwright state of mind. That's a novelist state of mind. It really is a weird thing that uh, as a playwright, you've written this thing and it, it exists in your mind uh, in a very particular way. And then a director is going to take that and put his or her spin all over it. And while it's still your thing, it's going to be interpreted by the director then it's going to be interpreted by the actors and right. there may be choices made that you never intended and, and that maybe even go you know against the entire grain of of what your intention was and I guess you just have to find a way to be okay with that uh, it's the same for a novelist except it's just one degree of separation because what you're saying a director does is exactly what a reader does like a it's a conversation right the book is a conversation between not me. It's a conversation between the book I wrote and the person reading it. Like, I don't even get to be in that conversation, which is terrible. I feel like if you want to read my book, you should come to my house and sit down and let me give you notes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's correct that it should be that way. Like it should be your own conversation. I'm being silly. Right. Right. But, uh, I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying, but, um, in with a novel, that novel will always exist in its published state. That's true. Um, whereas a play, um, depending on where you see it, um, that's the experience you get. You don't you right. Know, yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah. So, um, but from from playwriting, um, did you pick up things there that have helped you as a novelist? I, I you know, when you when you're writing scripts, either for for stage or screen, um, you know, one thing that that comes across pretty quickly is that those scripts are dialogue heavy because that's that's kind of the medium that you have there. You're you're putting words in people's mouth and then some stage direction, but it's mostly you're putting words in people's mouths. Does that bleed over into your novel writing? Um, not as much as you would think, the playwriting. I, I think it gave me a, a pretty good ear for dialogue be because as a playwright, you really concentrate on that. But the weird thing is I learned more about how to write novels from acting than I did from playwriting. Ah. Uh, I'm very, you know, even though this is a thriller and plot is super important and it's it's got to have that narrative drive that's kind of God right now. Um, all my books are character based, character driven. Like uh, most of the suspense comes not out of a situation or an action. It comes out of who these people are and what their personal stakes are. And, um, and for me as a writer, like I think as a writer, you've got to have three things in your car. You, you got to have plot, character and theme. And, you know, there's a bunch of other craft stuff too, but those are, the, those are the three, the three main deities in our pantheon. And you and somebody's got to drive that car. And in commercial fiction, it's plot. And in literary fiction, it's theme. And I kind of write in between those things. And I let character drive my car. Now, usually, um, plot is in the passenger seat and theme is hanging over the chair in between them in my books. <laughs> in this book, I let plot like shove over right up against the driver and like push the gas a little bit. <laughs> I love that. I love that imagery. Um, when you when you start thinking of a new story um when it's in its embryonic stage and it's becoming a thing um 
because you are very character driven, um, your stories are. Do characters come first, or Absolutely. do you? Have, okay, so so what is that process usually like? Is it? Um, do you do you envision a character that's that's in a plot situation? Is this just a character that's intriguing to you, and then you find ways to torture you know this person? <laughs> how, how does that how does that usually come alive to you? Um, it's I I'm always inventing characters. I'm I'm a very I, an easily bored person, and I have this toy in my head. You know, my brain is like a big toy. I don't like to brush my teeth. I don't like to clean the house. But you have to do these things. And I, I play in my brain while I do these things. I seldom – my eyes flip around the other way and I sometimes don't even remember cleaning the house. I'm so involved in whatever dumb thing I'm thinking about. And it's usually a character. I'm usually inventing a person. And some of these – I invent characters every day. And some of them stick around and start coming back and start feeling important. And usually – it's because they're tied to something that matters to me on a thematic level. Like they're tied to something in the – I think all the good books come from the dark and salty marshes of your mental illness, right? <laughs> right. Down under in the subconscious where I don't want to go. So my way of accessing it is to just imagine these people and they – and something in their personality or the situation I'm imagining them in or their family hits something that matters to me thematically. And those characters keep coming back. I, I don't take notes. If, they're, if they don't come back, they're not important. And um, over years, they will become richer and fuller. I've never written a book that didn't have at least one character in it who was over five years old. The longest I ever went with a character before putting them with a book uh, was 18 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's Crazy. awesome. <laughs> it, no, I, I'm just I'm, – I'm kind of processing all of that and, and yeah. kind of how – how that works. Um, what was what was the first book that you wrote that got published? Gods in Alabama. Gods in Alabama. Now, um, your accent is uh, is uh, a little lower America. Um, where are you from exactly? I grew up on the Redneck Riviera. Um, <laughs> So, and the reason my accent is tamped down, you have a little bit of an accent yourself. Yes. And that I'm, I'm like tofu. You can't put me near the cat box. You know, <laughs> I've got to stay near. I take on the flavor of whatever I'm around in terms of my, my voice. So when I go home to Alabama where my family is, it comes out. I get real Southern. If I am, um, if I have more than one drink of gin, I get a little more Southern, <laughs> but I did go to school for theater. And so I took voice classes and I learned that I can deliberately speak with a, you know, a television accent when I need to do that. Right. Of course. And, and you tamp down those things. Uh, um, what, what was, what was your experience growing up in, in Alabama and how do you feel like that affects uh, the way you tell stories? Well, I, I think the thing – you know, I grew up all over the South. Um, I My dad was Army, and I think I'd lived in seven southern states before I was nine years old. And then we settled on the coast of Florida just under the Alabama state line is where I went to high school and everything. And I think that you don't really know – you don't really understand the culture you're in. I mean I was just – that was just what life was like and what people were like. I think the big thing for me was when I when I left the South and went to um, went to grad school in Chicago. I I had never written Southern fiction or invested anything in the idea of the South or Southern settings until I got out of the South, and then I was like, "Holy God, we are so weird." <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, as someone who who grew up in Mississippi, um, I can I can completely relate. Um, there's something weird, um, about Southern fiction, um, because there's, there's not really a Midwestern fiction. There's not necessarily like a New England fiction, um, or, you know, a California fiction. It, it's, it's kind of weird that this collection of states and this weird subculture gets its own, um, you know, kind of shelf in, in the store. Um, what is it about the South that makes for compelling stories? Mm, it's our black and bloody history and our inability to talk about it directly. <laughs> Just go ahead and put it on front street yeah. then. Yeah. We're, we're passive aggressive, especially if you are a woman in the South, you're not raised to say anything you mean culturally. You're, you're, you're taught to just be constantly polite and please everyone. 
And so it comes out in stories. And I think, you know, even though Never Have I Ever is probably the least, it's not a Southern novel. I, I would say all my other novels are much more heavily influenced by Southern Gothic tradition than Never Have I Ever, which which left the conventions of Southern Gothic fiction and traded those out for the conventions of noir and suspense fiction. Um, but it still has, uh, it's still set in the South. In fact, it's set in the town where I graduated from high school. So I know that place very well. My mother-in-law still lives there. Wow. Um, is, is it, uh, is it easier, um, in storytelling to draw back on a place that you're so familiar with? And, um, does it help in the, the world building, uh, so to speak? Yeah, I don't, I tend not to write any place I have never been. In fact, I, I mean, if I if I don't know what it smells like there after it's rained, why would I set a book there? So I tend to set a lot of books in various areas of the South or in Chicago where I lived for seven years. Or I once had a book where a third of it took place in Berkeley, California, and I needed it to be in Berkeley, California for thematic reasons and plot reasons. And I have a friend who lives in San Leandro, which is butts up to Berkeley. It's another little town right there. And I called her. I was like, can I come live in your basement for a few weeks? And I went and, and spent a couple of weeks just wandering around Berkeley, meeting people, not doing anything, just being in Berkeley. And at the end, I mean, I, I was there for two and a half, three weeks. And I don't think I could write a novel where somebody born and bred in Berkeley, Berkeley's out. But what does a redneck think about Berkeley? That I could do. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that. It was enough. But yeah, I think you need to smell it. And and like uh, and I'm I'm that way about any sense of place. Like for never have I ever I knew the um the the narrator had to be a dive instructor for thematic reasons because like the uh, I knew it would be in this beach town and like the idea of going under the ocean and the that depth of that and the layers of it and the layers of the temperatures and like you know if you've ever been on a boat and dropped your sunglasses you know you the ocean's big enough you can lose anything in the ocean you can lose your whole past there so I wanted her to be a scuba diver and um I I realized not even three months in that there was no way I could do it unless I learned to be a scuba diver so I started taking dive lessons. I love that. Just to um, get that sense of place. Yeah, because it's those – and it's the little details that, uh, you know, you, you may spend three months learning to scuba dive, and and there may be, you know, two or three sentences worth that you really glean from that. But those are the most important sentences that, that without those can't – can't anchor yeah. you to that thing. Well, and two, I mean, there's lots of underwater scenes. There's underwater action scenes. I'll tell you something really funny. So I, my husband and I, he took scuba lessons with me, and we love it. We do it every chance we get now. And uh, well, I, I'm, I became – like, it changed the book because – I thought it would be one way, and really everything Amy says about scuba diving is is how I feel about it. It is a prayer. It is a meditation. It is peace. It is also the most fun you can have in a wetsuit. Um, and so I I went and I started taking these lessons, and <laughs> – like we went to do our checkout dives and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, Oh, I need to scout locations. There's going to be underwater action scenes. I've got to find locations. And I, I said to the scuba dive instructor without thinking it, I'm asking him all these questions. And I'm like, so if I wanted to kill someone underwater, how would I do that? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> what? I'm like, I'm a novelist. I'm a novelist. I promise. If you tell me, if you help me kill someone underwater, I will never do it for real. And so they, I had a scuba dive instructor who helped me work out the crime scenes and how to commit crime underwater. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's Super amazing. Yeah. Um, going back just for a minute to your, um, your acting, uh, career, um, you, you now are, are using those skills, uh, as an audiobook narrator and, you know, audiobooks are, I think everybody has realized is one of the biggest growth markets right now in, in publishing, and mm -hmm. people are going nuts for audiobooks. Um, a, as someone who's been on both sides, who writes the manuscript and then uh, reads your own books and then have, have read other people's books, um, does, does knowing that this is going to be acted out in that way, does that affect the writing? Yes, hugely. 
I would never hand a book to my editor that I hadn't read aloud. In fact, that was before I was reading audiobooks. I believe in, I think every writer should read their book aloud. It will fix your dot. It's even better if you don't have any acting experience and you're not good at listening to yourself in that way, like an actor. If you can get somebody to read it to you or read the dialogue with you, just having somebody read one chapter to you out loud, I think would change how you think about your drafting process. As an audiobook reader, I can tell, I'm not going to say any names, but I can tell the people who have read their book aloud and who have not because it, because like there's this weird internal rhyme thing that you don't see visually, but some like in published books written by really good authors, I hit sentences like, I dread to wear red, she said to Fred, and they they just don't, <laughs> like, like, they don't they don't hear it because they're looking at the words visually. And that, that is, that's very difficult when you're doing audiobook reading to, when you hit those internal rhymes to try and find inflection. So to keep it from becoming sing, sing song. And you'd be surprised at how much internal rhyme gets into books. If you don't read them out, like really a lot. Yeah. And there are some sentences that just feel weird in your mouth. Um, and, and you're yes. like this, this is, yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of, of reading out loud as well. I, I, I usually try to perform all the characters and, and, and Heck yeah. You know, yeah, it's just, it's so much fun. And, and you're right. You will catch all kinds of things. It'll uh, also help your dialogue like, whoa, you know, yes. dialogue, especially try to say it out loud to someone while looking them in the face. If you can't get through the line, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> oh, it, it'll also catch, you know, too much exposition when you've got a character that in their dialogue just goes all expository. Yeah. Uh, when you start reading that, you're like, there's nobody would ever do this. This is I've got to find a better way to do this. Um, tell me about reforming arts. Oh, I love reforming arts so much. It's a, a small nonprofit that I work with local to Georgia. Um, and what we do is we provide college level liberal arts education to people who are incarcerated in Georgia's women's prisons. I serve on the board all year and I try to teach one semester a year as a volunteer. Um, we also have a lot of our teachers are not volunteers now because we've partnered with Georgia state university perimeter college. And, you know, so some, some, classes are being taught for credit. And I, I can, I, I'm allowed to teach those because I, you know, I have a master's degree. I've taught at the college level before, but I, 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 I haven't done that yet. I usually go in as a volunteer and teach like a creative writing workshop or something I call creative composition, which works with, you know, creative writing, but it's also focused on form and grammar just to help, you know, get the writing skills up because that's extremely helpful, I think, for people. Um, but yeah, we teach people are now in, who are incarcerated can pursue uh, an AA degree or, or get college coursework for when they're out. Um, because I think education provides opportunity and opportunity stops recidivism. And that's just true. Every study proves it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's uh, intriguing that um, uh, the that the the nonprofit focuses on a liberal arts education um, and instead of just teaching a skill, which I think is also very important. And I think there's those things are are needed. Um, but there, there's something about learning uh, and learning to learn. Um, what have you seen uh, in, in in teaching writing specifically? Um, how have you seen this kind of project? Um, oh, it's, you know, change people and inform their lives. It's so important. The arts are so important. And, and especially, especially in, you know, for people who are incarcerated, because I'll tell you the one thing 99.9% .9 of my students have in common. I've had students who were under 20. I've had students who were over 70. I've had students of all races. I've had students, you know, of, of all sexual orientations and, and gender identities. Um, very diverse class, 99.9% .9 of them come out of grinding poverty and really unstable family situations, which are two things that often go hand in hand. They're, they're coming out of 
of chaos and need where there's no there's no stability of or emotional support and there's no stability in terms of just like food stability what am i going to eat today and these are the people who end up getting incarcerated because they they don't get a, a lawyer or a chance and also like they don't they present you know if you're if you're middle class you can go and you've had a good education and you have a mom and a dad who care about you, you can go in and say, hello, I have made a terrible mistake. You know, they don't have great vocabularies, a lot of them, they are, or they have never gotten a really strong education. And so two things that are really helpful are just like letting them have a way to access their own narrative and tell their story. Because if you are given these tools and you learn how to tell your story, you can start shaping your own narrative. You can reinterpret things. You can, you can understand things. You can, you can put your story into it and you're reading, you know, important, really good books. So you're reading good literature and you can put that, which I think reading fosters empathy and writing fosters empathy. So you're telling your story and you're reading other people's stories and you're putting your story in a context. And if you can, if you can tell your narrative in a, in a cogent way so that you can see the arc of it, you can change your narrative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Let's let's talk about the new book um, for a minute, and I, we'll put. Uh, is is there a place where people can find out about reforming arts? And sure, uh, you can go to reformingarts dot org and read all about us, or give us money. We would like that too. <laughs> that's what we want to encourage people to. Do. I'll put a link to that in the show notes of this episode. We we definitely want to support uh, people that are doing that kind of work for sure. Um, the new book, Never Have I Ever. Yes. Um, tell me about this book. Um, or tell our listeners about this book. I have read the book, um, but uh, they may not have yet. Tell us where this book comes from, and why is this book so different from the books you've written in the past? Oh gosh. Um. So just to you know, give you the like the the little jacket copy kind of idea of what the book is about. It's about a woman named Amy Way. She is a scuba diving instructor. She's happily married. Uh, she and her teenage stepdaughter actually get along, and she has a an eight month old baby. Um, and she has a nice life. Like she really likes her life. She has a book club that she runs her best friend and, and it's a good life. And one that is too much right going on. (laughs) Well, you know, I always say making like make, you know, make vegetable lasagna and walk the dog. That's a great life. It's a terrible book, but it's a really good life. (laughs) So she has the kind of life that would not normally make a good book. But it opens uh, at book club. She's at book club with her friend and a new woman shows up, Angelica Rue. And Angelica is not like the women at this seaside university town. She like uh, Amy says it's like she seems like somebody who would know how to make pate from scratch or somebody who's had sex in a moving vehicle, maybe on the way here. You know, she's exotic. And, and she gets everybody she, – she derails the book conversation, gets everybody drunk, gets everybody playing a game of Never Have I Ever, which is a drinking game that makes you reveal things you might not want to reveal about yourself. And very quickly, it becomes apparent to Amy that this is not random. The game is aimed at her. She knows that this person Amy has created and this life Amy has created is a construct. Amy was a very different person 15 years ago, and Rue knows. And in order to protect that life, like, like Rue has an agenda. And if Amy doesn't do what Rue wants, Rue's going to expose her. And it, it should be like, normally this is called a cat and mouse game kind of a book. But Rue has made a grave error, and it's this. Amy's a cat. Amy's another cat. <laughs> so it's a cat, and Amy steps up. And I, I think as Amy steps up, and she's like, I'm going to play this. I'm going to, you know, and it's not a game she can afford to lose. If she loses, she loses everything. And the same is true for Rue. Like, it becomes, Amy gets into Rue's head, and it gets very high stakes. It's sort of like, um, like, it's if you like Killing Eve, you'll probably like this book. It's It's about Two women who have made very different choices, but if they were to, like, take a Myers-Briggs test or an Enneagram, they're very similar people. Like, they'd both be Slytherin, right? 
Um, <laughs> so they're they're pretty evenly matched. Rue has a lot more practice, but Amy is fighting for, you know, a lot of things that she cares about. So so she's more desperate. So Rue has more practice. She's more desperate. And and I think that was like, and especially since like her stepdaughter's kind of getting involved with Rue's teenage son. Like there's a there like the stakes keep raising in these ways. And I think that uh, that's probably how it's different from Killing Eve is that. I did want to look at that classic story of when you look into the abyss, the abyss looks back. And how do you, how do you fight evil without becoming evil? Like that's a story that's usually told with male protagonists. I've seen it a million times with men. I wanted to see how it would be different if it was women, which I think killing Eve answers that pretty definitively. But I also wanted to see how it would be different if it was mothers. And I, I think the most dangerous animal is a mother anything. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. So that's uh, that's what the book's about. So um, you you mentioned early on um, that uh, three the three elements that you always hold close or uh, we're riding in the car with are character, plot, and theme. Uh, theme is not something we talk a lot about in this type of book. And, you know, when we're talking suspense and, and mystery, um, how do you pursue theme and how does it, how does it, well, do you understand the theme from the beginning or is theme something that grows in the telling? Um, it depends on the book. Sometimes I, I feel compelled to write a book and I don't know why until I, make my way to the theme. And then I'm like, Oh, that's why this is my book. This book I knew from the very start. Um, there, the book I wrote before this, a character turns to another and says, you can't walk around holding the worst thing you ever did in your hand, staring at it. You got to make supper and plant zinnias. You know, (laughs) (laughs) you can't, you can't do that. And when I wrote that line, I thought, Oh, that's my next book. I didn't I didn't actually know it would be a thriller. I just knew that line was my next book. And and for me the idea of I, I mean I've long called myself a redemption obsessed novelist. I'm always interested in like how far can you walk into the black before you fall off the world and you're lost? And what are the little tiny lights that call you home? And why do some people with ropes around them and lights all over walk off the world. And why do some people, you know, see some tiny pinpoint behind them and turn back from the edge and make their way back to community and hope and grace. This is, and, and that, and my goal for this book, like really seriously is, you know what, if you want to make a gin and tonic and go to the beach and read a twisty thriller, it's here for you. Have fun. But if you want, if you want to think about, what grace looks like. If you want to think about these things, it's there for you. It's just an underlayer that I didn't want it to interfere with story, but I don't think I would have been interested in writing the story if that theme wasn't leaning over the front seat yakking. <laughs> right, right. Well, what's what's really interesting, and, and now that I start thinking of uh, of theme and and your love for redemption stories, which I also um, absolutely love. Uh, is that in the beginning, Amy thinks that she's living her redemption story yes. um, <laughs> a- already. You know, she feels like that she, you know, there, there are things in her past and that's you know kind of the catalyst for what gets the story going. Uh, and we all have secrets that we would rather not come out and we all have progressed and evolved as human beings and would never want to be held responsible for the person we were 15 years ago or, or whatever. I think we, we all kind of live in that way. Um, and, and in a way, Amy feels like that she's, she's become the person she wanted to be. That is her redemption story in her mind until she realizes that, uh, that it's not, that there's still a journey to be taken um, that's so much fun. How, how did that, that idea of, of someone that, that is already, um, you know, living, uh, living out who she wanted to be getting away from the past, then gets confronted with that. How, how does that start taking shape for you? Um, two, two things. One, I'll just say very briefly, I am a person who has reinvented myself more than once. I honestly, I have a great life. I make vegetable lasagna. I walk the dog. Um, I've, I really like my husband. I have 
great kids. We live someplace that I, I enjoy my community and my neighbors and my church. Um, but my life wasn't always like that. And I, I can't believe I'm alive. When I was a young woman, 19, 20, 21, all the people I was closest to at that point, most of them disappeared, went to prison. Some are dead. So one died in a gun battle with police. One overdosed. I, I could have, uh, you know, I, there was a tiny light that called me back. Um, so it's personal. Uh, on a on another level, it's reforming arts. I, I remember I have a student who I care very much about. She's been I, I've known her for years. She has been in prison for more than thirty years. She's finally up for parole, and in the next few years, she might be getting out. And she is an amazing human being. She, this thirty something years ago, she did something, and she went to prison for it for a very long time. And now. She writes, illustrates, and distributes these sort of how to navigate prison and make good choices, like comic strips to other people that are incarcerated. She is um, in Life University, and she is, has a 4.0, and I think she's I, – I haven't, I haven't been – to, I, if if everything stayed on track, she should be graduated by now. I haven't seen her since the last semester that I taught. And I'm not, because I work with reforming arts, I'm not allowed to have contact with people except under that umbrella. Like there's the, the prison has rules. So I won't know until I go next time and catch up with her. But um, she was on track to graduate with a 4.0. She is a role model. And I remember her saying to me, She's like, you know, I'm up for parole now, and I think they'll they'll let me out. Like, she's been a model prisoner, and she's done a lot of really good stuff community-wise. And she's like, here's my fear. I'm I'm always going to be, you know, a felon. I'm, I'm, my worry is I'll go back out into the world, and everybody will see me as nothing but the worst thing I ever did in my whole life that I did 35 years ago. That that's all I am is that action. And that I'll go to an employer or try to get an apartment and they won't talk to me or see me. It'll just be this one thing. And I'm not even that person anymore. And and so, like, I thought about, like, I wanted to start at a place where Amy's not that person. And she's not. She's not that person anymore. And Rue comes in and says, yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one one thing that I love about the book, um, never have I ever. It's uh, it it lets us know that our redemption stories are ongoing, um, and and those around us uh, have an ongoing redemption story. None of us have arrived uh, at our final destination, and none of us have become who we ultimately will be, and we sure as heck are not the people we used to be. Um, and while this this book deals with a lot of heavy, heavy themes, it's also a lot of fun. Yeah. It's just a, it's, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, just, yeah, I love a plot twist, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. I love a plot twist. I like there to be kissing and shooting, usually with a few pages <laughs> of each other. <laughs> Sometimes at the same time. You yeah, know, you heck know. Yeah, yeah. Bring yeah. it. <laughs> And, you know, a little undersea murder never hurts either. Nah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I love the book, Jocelyn. I, I love everything that you're doing. Um, if people are just discovering you, want to find out more about um, your work and your back catalog and follow along with news coming up, uh, where can they connect with you? Oh, I have a website, JocelynJackson.com, and I am on the Instagram, Jocelyn Jackson. And, you know, my name is spelled weird. I'm on the Facebook and the Twitter <laughs> I, and I use them for different things. Like Facebook is really just like book news. If you just want to know when books are coming out and what's going on, that's pretty much what I use Facebook for. Instagram, I kind of use as a mini blog unless I have a book right about to come out and then it gets a little propaganda heavy. Sorry, but you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> and then Twitter, I almost never do book promotion. It's just to chat. Gotcha. <laughs> so gotcha. it's really what you want. Gotcha. Well, we'll put links to all of that in the show notes and the link to where they can buy the new book, Never Have I Ever. When folks are hearing this, it's release day for the book. Go out and grab your copy. Uh, it's uh, in, in every format. Uh, do, do you read the audio for this one as well? I sure do. I love it. I love it. Um, Jocelyn, this has been so much fun chatting. Um, we'll send everybody to see you and to pick up the book. 
thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I had a good time. You're so fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Mather steepled his hands. You asked to join us once? Hedwick leaned forward eagerly. The appointed. Does that appeal? Yes. Do you even know what we do? My grandmother used to say that you control the world. That's not far off. But why? To what end? I don't know. Power? Pour me a bourbon. Mather reached into his briefcase and produced a file folder. I want to tell you one story. Have you ever heard of Centralia, Pennsylvania? No. He produced a photo for Hedwig's inspection. Spring of 1962. A pretty little town, wasn't it? Whitewash and ticky-tacky, pastel housewives and perfect lawns. A mining community, mostly. Coal. He turned over a second photo. A lovely young woman. There was a single witch in Centralia named Anna Lively. Anna had a green thumb. She could make her garden grow, whisper to a flower, and send it shooting from the ground like that. Just lovely. But she was discovered. That spring, a boy named Bobby Avery received a Bell and Howell Zoomatic movie camera for his 11th birthday. Bobby amused himself by filming his neighbors, sometimes without their knowledge, through windows and over garden fences. Twelve seconds of film. Just a girl and her garden patch and one swiftly blooming rose. It killed the town. Bobby showed it to his friends. Children believe readily. Bobby was the first to die. Parents looked into it, watched the film themselves, and they began to die. Anna disappeared. Perhaps they attacked her. Perhaps she escaped. But even in her absence, knowledge of a true witch was running wild through the population, as if Anna had beckoned it herself to grow verdant and spread. The great curse had killed 64 Centralians by the 1st of June. The footage was offered to a national news organization. That was the precipice. It might have been shown in prime time, between Leave It to Beaver and My Three Sons. We came very close to another worldwide calamity, but we were fortunate. One of our own was in place at the network. He alerted his superiors, and they ended the situation. Do you know how? I'm afraid to ask. Mather laid down another photo. This is Centralia today. It was an aerial view of a forest. Endless trees and underbrush cut through by lanes of pavement. Just a maze of cracking asphalt, like the foundations of Sodom, ripped bare by the wrath of God. Only a cemetery remained, on a hill overlooking the former town. A white marble angel stood among the graves, grieving for the ruins below, like Lot's wife, turned to salt. You destroyed the whole town? Not I. This was well before my time, but yes. Just as you'd cauterize a wound to stop a patient from bleeding to death. We blamed it on an uncontrollable mine fire deep below the earth. We actually set the coal burning in case someone investigated. It burns today. Touch any of those streets and you'll find them hot, the asphalt melting as if the town sat just above perdition. It's not something we're proud of, but it was necessary to save the world. Centralia, Pennsylvania, and everyone who'd seen that film had to be sacrificed. Mather collected the photos. So, that is why the appointed exist, and that is what we do. Still want to join? <laughs>